Namaste. I'm Davina Gupta and this is Work Life India on the BBC from Delhi. Now the world's fastest land animal is set to make a comeback in India after almost 70 years. The cheetah was declared extinct in the country in 1952, but now the Indian government has been working to relocate some African cheetahs here to revive their population. So stay with us as we talk about bringing the cheetah back to India. So let's start with our guest panel here in the studio. First up we have Dr. Ravi Chellam. He's the CEO of Meta String Foundation and coordinator of Biodiversity Collaborative. Welcome Dr. Chellam. How are you? Thank you. We also have Professor Adrian Tortif. He's a vet wildlife specialist at the University of Pretoria. He's joining us from South Africa. So thank you so much Adrian for taking our time. You're actually involved in the project to bring cheetah back to India. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. It's very nice to be here. and we have Vivek Menon he's founder and executive director of the Wildlife Trust of India who just spotted a cheetah 2 weeks ago Vivek how was the experience it was fantastic 2 uh, weeks ago in Amboseli i saw a mother a cheetah and and her cubs and the mother was bringing down a tommy gazelle gazelle for the for the cubs so it was a great experience to see a cheetah hunt Wow, I wish we could have that experience in India and live to tell the story as well. But let's get this conversation started. Uh, so, Adrian, first to you. You've been involved in this plan to get cheetahs back. Uh, what's the plan, and how many cheetahs are we talking about? And when is the big question? <laughs> It's the big question. Yeah. Uh, we currently have twelve cheetahs that here in South Africa that are in quarantine facilities. they have undergone all the disease testing uh, vaccinations and they are ready to go and then in namibia there are also around 8 animals um they have actually they're a little bit behind uh, us in south africa on the disease testing and the vaccination process so they should be ready in about 2 to 3 weeks time uh the mou between south africa and india uh, we are still waiting for our minister to sign that mou as far as i'm aware they are still planning to send another delegation of government officials mm-hmm. to india in the next few days uh to visit kuno so at this stage it's unclear as to when the cheetahs will actually be um moved to india but it's likely to happen sometime around mid september fingers crossed there i'm sure the team is excited so the paperwork between namibia and india is done it's between south africa and india that we are waiting for that and kuno national park which is in the central indian state of madhya pradesh is where uh, we are expecting cheetahs to come but uh, vivek uh, this is a big move isn't it i think it's one of the biggest relocation projects that's happening in the world of a large carnivore but cheetahs are actually there in india it was only in 1952 that they were extinct um i have read stories about how in the 16th century during the mughal period there were as many as 10000 cheetahs with the mughal emperor jahangir at that point of time how did india reach the stage that they were extinct yeah to begin with uh, they were absolutely correct by the way almost all that you said uh, if if you read the tusuke jahangir jahangir actually talks not only about the cheetahs in his father's stable but also the fact Uh, that the cheetah gave birth and like an excited boy he actually went cupped his hand beneath the teat of the mother and tasted the milk whoa uh, and he said you know <laughs> so jahangir was was an interesting naturalist uh, emperor that we had so uh, they had cheetahs uh, roaming in india at that time uh, but really uh, across a large part of india this is the only large mammal that we have lost we lost it uh, primarily due to hunting and also due to lo- loss of habitat mm-hmm. and prey yeah you know, hunting not only of the animal but also the prey Uh, and so uh, indeed it's a very very big project to try and bring it back uh, to india absolutely and so your generation my generation we haven't actually seen a cheetah in india right, but right, uh, yeah. ravi this project is not cheap because almost 9 billion dollar plus is being spent um the major sponsor for this project is the indian oil corporation which is a government owned petroleum unit uh, you've said in um, your articles it seems that it's a vanity project could you explain that my problem with this is cheetahs are not even mentioned in the national wildlife action plan mm-hmm. which in some sense is the guiding document for government policy and action mm-hmm. and this is an action plan which covers the period 2017 to 31 so it's not something which is dated 20 years ago it's the mm-hmm. current operating plan and cheetahs are not even mentioned in that and the claims made in the action plan which was released earlier this year 
says that cheetahs will come from Africa and help us save our open forests and grassland ecosystems and the species that are contained in that. Unfortunately, the action plan is based on very poor science, makes fantastic claims on conservation objectives, which by their own facts do not stand up to scrutiny. And there was a rush to get the cheetahs in time for our 70, completion of 75 years of independence and for whatever reason they didn't come. So this whole thing of trying to bring it for a particular event in our social history rather than use science, ecology okay. and conservation was the problem. That's your view. Vivek, is it more symbolic than practical to reintroduce the species in India? So that's, uh, that's interesting. Um, it could be symbolic, absolutely. Uh, but it's not symbolic or practical. The two are not uh, necessarily, mm -hmm. you know, um, against each other. You can be practical and symbolic. Uh, we, uh, we used to reintroduce uh, often elephants into Manas National Park, the Wildlife Trust of India, okay, for 10 years. Mm -hmm. I didn't do that because there were not enough elephants, although there were some poaching there and one could put it back. I did that to win the pride of the Bodos who felt that they had finished the park during an uprising. They wanted to bring it back. And they, the wanted, and they wanted the elephant. So a symbolic movement of an animal can often bring back lost pride or lost, you know, a stir a sleeping giant, including the government of India, into action. I mean, they could have done this without that, but with this, why not? I mean, it, it, it's definitely a possibility. Whether it's practical or not is an entirely different question. Yeah. Adrian, where do you stand on this argument? Um, do you believe that cheetahs are important for the larger ecosystem that we have at the Kuno National Park in India? Well, there are two main benefits to this project, and they come from different sides. One is from the South African side mm -hmm. and our view of global cheetah conservation. And I need to explain that a little bit. Um, in South Africa, we have one of the only growing populations of cheetahs anywhere in the world. Yeah. If we don't export cheetahs now, uh, very soon, we've got at least 40 surplus animals per year. Yeah. We will have to start putting animals in our reserves on contraceptives because those animals are having an impact on other game species in those parks. So, and that for me is an absolute tragedy if we had to do that. We've reached a situation where we actually don't have any new reserves coming online at the moment which are willing to take uh, cheetahs. And so we have started some international introductions, reintroductions. We've sent cheetahs to Malawi, to Zambia, to Mozambique. Um, now, it's not a matter of just dumping animals. If we wanted to send animals out into Africa, we could send them to plenty of other countries where they wouldn't be protected, where they would be at risk of poaching, where they would be at risk of getting caught in snares for, you know, with the bushmeat trade and so on. But this, you know, India, we feel, is a, is a potentially safe environment compared to many other reintroduction places, and that is really why it's important from our point of view. From the other side, I've been to places in India where, you know, especially these grassland um, forest mosaic areas, which are highly uh, impacted by human activities. Mm -hmm. And we can talk about the, you know, species like, for instance, the Indian bustard and so on, and protecting those kinds of species in that environment. But unless you protect the grasslands, um, then that's not really going to happen. And I don't think many people care about the Indian bustard. They should, but they don't really care. Politicians don't care necessarily about animals like that. Um, but when, as soon as you start talking about the cheetah, it's a keystone species. It's a charismatic animal. It's an animal that attracts funding. It's an animal that attracts attention. And it's that... You know, if you want to keep cheetahs alive, you need to keep their prey species alive. If you want to keep their prey species alive, you need to keep grass, uh, you need to have grass, which means that you have to get rid of cattle in reserves. You need to move them out. Mm -hmm. And I don't think there's a strong incentive in India necessarily to do that unless you have the cheetah. But Ravi, what are the challenges that you foresee um, when uh, the African cheetahs make their way to the Indian sanctuary? First of all, inadequate space. Cheetahs exist in densities, even in Masai Mara Serengeti ecosystem, at about one per hundred square kilometers. Adult females in the best of the habitats have home ranges exceeding 800 square kilometers, which can go up to 1,600 square kilometers. Where is the space? We are talking of a model of fence reserves to an Indian situation where fences are just not used. None of our reserves are fenced. If at all, there's one, which is Mukundra, which uh, some of the project proponents said should be the place they should take cheetahs first. 
for whatever reasons, they've not done that. My question really is, why should Kuno, which has been reserved for reintroduction of lines based on the Supreme Court order going back to 2013, be the site for cheetahs? If lions can't be moved from Gujarat, is it easier to move cheetahs from Africa to Kuno? And cheetah, as I said, doesn't even figure in our National Wildlife Action Plan. So, How can an African priority suddenly become national priority for us? Vivek, do you want to come in? Because your yeah. team was among those who actually suggested different sites for uh, yeah. getting cheetahs relocated. Yeah, sure. And uh, I'd like to come in actually on his first point. Uh, I mean, I don't often disagree with my friend, uh, Ravi, but this one I'll disagree because uh, if you if you look at the tigers, for example, in, in the Russian Far East, they, they occupy spaces which are far, far bigger than uh, what they do in India. So these cats are highly adaptable. And uh, sure, in Africa, some of them uh, have, have larger spaces, but when confined to smaller spaces, they do adapt. So I, I really think that should not be a problem. Sure. Now, on the other point that you made, which is, did two things. One is we held a very large meeting where we called literally all the cheetah experts of the world, the, the IUCN cat specialist group chairman, the IUCN health specialist group chairman, the IUCN reintroduction specialist group chairman, literally everybody. I hosted the whole lot. Mm. And the politicians and everybody. And everybody came to a conclusion after about a week of intense scientific uh, mm. thought that this is possible. Okay, And then we laid down some criteria there. Uh, and, and then the Wildlife Trust of India and the Wildlife Institute of India surveyed 10 potential habitats of which we prioritized three, the, uh, the Wildlife Institute and the government, after which chose Kuno. Okay? Uh, but it was definitely uh, it was definitely one of the one of the sites in the ten area. But may I also ask you this: Should bringing cheetah back be a national priority? Uh, if you look at uh, 2019, the statistics was revealed in the Legislative Assembly of Gujarat in the Western Indian state that some 222 lions yep. uh, had passed away in just two years. Mm -hmm. um, majorly because of natural causes. But shouldn't you be directing more resources at those species which are there in India to conserve them? No, rather the, than looking the, at cheetahs? There is absolutely no question that the lion must have yeah. all priority. And or the bustard, and or the florican, or the caracal, things that people have been talking about. I mean, I keep asking people, what do you have for breakfast? Is it is it uh, omelette every day? Or is it uh, dosa in Italy if you're from southern India? or Parata? You can have all three on different days. So there's no question of uh, you know giving up one for the other. But then resources are limited, aren't they? Uh, well, is it for India, really? Hmm. The resources that they give wildlife is limited. They seem to have doled out enough now because, like my friend Adrian said, that this is a, f a cat with forward-facing eyes. It has captured the imagination of the politic. And conservation is about capturing the imagination of the politic. Okay. Adrian, here's the point. Mm. What's the success rate that we're looking at after uh, cheetahs are relocated, as Vivek pointed out? Uh, because looking at what had happened in Malawi, 20% of those big cats actually died after the first year? Yes, I think we, we can never think of a success as 100%. I mean, that would be ridiculous. If you left those animals in the environment from which they came, a certain number of them would have died anyway. Um, so we judge the success based on what we see after three, four, five years. So um, in terms of the success in Kuno, I mean, they, you know, um, there are a number of reserves besides Kuno. Kuno is just the starting point. Mm -hmm. But to be honest, in South Africa, we have some reserves that uh, the, our most successful reserve uh, for cheetahs is Pinda. We've exported more than 74 cheetahs out of that reserve that have gone to other reserves in South Africa. And that environment is mixed bushland. It's got, uh, you know, um, some sand forest areas. It's, it's very, very similar to Kuno uh, in terms of environment. And um, there they exist with lions as well as leopards, uh, hyenas, you know, so there's a mixture, uh, you know, of um, large carnivores. Mm. And I don't okay. think, I, I, you know, there's every chance of success in Kuno, and I think that we, it's well worth taking that, you know, risk. But Vivek, uh, isn't having 30 leopards in the Kuno National Park also a risk? Because um, essentially they don't... Uh, adapt well to each other. In fact, if I'm not wrong, there are some elephants which have been deployed and uh, so that they can scare away the leopard for the moment. What else can be done to ease their integration in that environment? So I, I think, I mean, although I'm not involved in actually putting them into, into that enclosure, I think what is happening is uh, leopard-proofing that enclosure. 
for the time that this animal gets to adapt. That's part of normal translocation protocols across the world for any animal. But Adrian, is there a plan to monitor movement of cheetahs as well because they can disperse easily in any direction? There would also be a chance yes. or a danger of them becoming isolated, moving towards human settlement? Absolutely. Um, and all of the cheetahs that we're going to be introducing into Kuno are going to be wearing uh, satellite collars uh, so they can be tracked, you know, they'll be monitored um, on an ongoing basis. Um, from our experience in Mozambique, we've seen that some cheetahs uh, will start moving in directions away from the core introduction site. And we have experience with that in knowing that we have to bring those animals back. And after you do that once or twice, the animals then settle down. Um, so there is, particularly amongst the males, a tendency to want to move away. But, um, you know, that can be managed and we plan to do that. Um, Ravi, India is a populous nation. We're seeing shrinking cover of the forest as well here. Uh, how do you see the human cheetah conflict once they're reintroduced at Kuno and other sites as well? Not Nothing that I would worry too much about. I think the conflict would be more felt by the cheetah in terms of dogs, in terms of uh, poisoning, in terms, just because they exist in such low densities, they're going to be moving far, far more. This one, one place I'll agree yes, with him 100%. Because, yeah. because, I mean, if you were to bring in a big cat, it's the, probably the cat with the least conflict possibilities. A cheetah is not really known to have uh, conflict with uh, humans in Africa, despite tolerance levels in India being much, much more to th mm. the sort of conflict than in Africa. Yeah? So we wouldn't really worry about conflict. That's okay. really not the thing. I, I want to actually quote the geneticist Pamela Berger, who suggested that uh, the Asiatic cheetahs developed specialized traits that made them adept at living in mountainous regions, which the African cheetahs do not have that kind of ability. Uh, Adrian, where do you stand on this? Because uh, she'd clearly stated that it would be like having an African lion in a wild park in Europe. You can have that, but then it's an African lion living in Europe, not a European lion. I certainly would disagree because I think that in um, Africa, and certainly in Southern Africa, the Southern African cheetah occurs across a vast number of different types of terrain, from the hot deserts of Namibia to the very cold winters in, in the Karoo, all the way across to the uh, other eastern side of the country in Mozambique and northern KwaZulu-Natal, where we have very high rainfall mm. and very dense thickets, and where the cheetah really is not an open plains hunter, but a, an ambush predator. So, you know, mountainous areas, I've been up in the Sotpansberg Mountains and seen evidence of cheetahs up there too. So, you know, the, 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 the idea that the African cheetah is simply adapted to the open plains of the Serengeti is just ludicrous. That's where we film them. That's where we can see them clearly. But um, And that's where most of the films were made. But that does not mean that the animal exists only in that kind of uh, environment. If we, we look at the Asiatic cheetah and we would try and introduce mm. it, I mean, we're looking at 12 individual animals. And the inbreeding depression that's occurred in that population is also tremendous compared to you know the, the, the southern African cheetah. Uh, Vivek, you want to come in? I want to come in on the genetics part again, because yeah. Steve O'Brien, who was, who was the granddaddy of geneticists, was uh, present in India. I, I called him personally and brought him in here. And he listened to all this and he said, after the 10,000-year bottleneck of the cheetahs, there is nothing called an African cheetah or an Asian cheetah, really, in terms of their not being able to adapt or move, right? We're talking subspecies. means geographically distinct, but not that genetically distinct for us to really mm -hmm. worry about it all this much. Okay, but um, uh, Ravi... Given the fact that we are having cheetahs reintroduced now, uh, will it also be under the semi-captive conditions? Because uh, essentially what you're talking about is a huge, secured, open-air facility which is regularly monitored? I think monitoring is important. Um, there's value in monitoring for all species, for mm -hmm. all habitats, for all interactions. To me, the challenge is the claim that it will play the top predator ecological role. At those numbers, at those densities, at that distribution, what kind of ecological role it can play? Mm -hmm. That is the big question. I think the claims are too far-fetched. It's going to take enormous amount of time. I can't see continued commitment for that kind of thing. And the levels of investment, no conservation project in India has been budgeted at that level. 
what is so special about an African animal coming into India that we need to divert those kind of resources? Mm. But we've seen Project Tiger, which has seen success. Uh, it has seen significant corporate interest as well. We've seen government initiative as well that was taken. And um, Adrian, the other big challenge for cheetahs would also be poaching and illegal hunting. And we've seen, uh, Vivek, that Project Tiger has been able to deal with it quite successfully because they were able to raise general awareness around it. They were able to open local population, encourage ecotourism, which was also a means of earning uh, for people who are living in that area. So there was sort of a collective effort to save these tigers. Could we see similar amount of uh, awareness, similar amount of knowledge and initiative when cheetahs come here? There is always a threat in a country like India with 1.3 billion people, with uh, people who uh, are living on the fringe of poverty. There would be somebody wanting to go and kill and, and make a little extra money. So which is why you need to have a very, very strong uh, enforcement system in place, as well as community involvement, as well as what, you, what you're talking about in terms of livelihood. Now, if you were to do such a thing with an animal, then a cheetah is a damn good animal to do it with. Forward-facing eyes, good-looking. People will like to see it. People will want to be it. It doesn't have too much of a conflict. So it, it is an ideal candidate. If, like Ravi says, the government continues that uh, push, it should not be a one-off influx of uh, funds and or priority and or animals. I mean, that has to be steady for the next 20 years or 25 years. Then it can be a success. Adrian, your thoughts on it? Because you've seen the population of tiger, thanks to this project, almost come up by 45% from uh, early 70s uh, to the last census that was taken, I believe, in 2018. There were some 2,200 tigers already. Given that we've seen this kind of success with tigers, what's the timeline you have in mind for cheetah's population uh, to rehabilitate and also be able to breed in India? What's the timeline that you see? So we're looking at a, a time frame of about five to 10 years to establish a viable population, but we would never leave the population. We would always, we have from the beginning considered the Indian population to be an extension of the Southern African population in terms of the meta population planning. And at least for the next 20 or 50 years, we anticipate moving animals backwards and forwards to participate okay. and make sure that there's a gene flow between these um, different populations. So once we see success here in India, a uh, few years down the line, do we see also this project and this sort of uh, translocation of cheetahs in other countries as well? Are queries already pouring in for that? It would be a dream to see it move from India into Pakistan, into other areas in the Middle East, Afghanistan. I mean, I know those may not be uh, ideal spots right at the moment, but you know, we need to be looking much further into the future. And that is certainly a dream that we would have that the cheetah will occupy at least 50 or 60 or 70 percent of its original range. Hmm. So uh, as we wind this up, gentlemen, last thoughts from you as well, Ravi. Are there takeaways from Project Cheetahs that you would uh, advise policymakers for other species as well? Use much better science. Yeah. Be consistent with your policy. Do not suddenly introduce something which disrupts ongoing conservation efforts. So to me, if the action plan is the foundation for this project, it is very difficult for me to see it succeed. So you don't think that this project would succeed? Not based on the action plan that's been released. After another 30, 40 years, you'll have 36 cheetahs. What kind of numbers, what kind of investment are we going to do to even reach those numbers? Is that a sign of success? What kind of, I mean, it only talks of Kuno. The action plan doesn't really go into other sites. If you talk your meta population, why are the habitats not ready even before the cheetah comes? We are putting the cart before the horse. We, this is a diversionary tactic. It is taking away much needed attention from far more important priority conservation issues in this country. All right. With that, uh, Adrian, you have a tough work at hand. So thank you so much for joining us. And thank you also, Vivek, for sharing your insights. And Ravi, always a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's very nice to be here. Well, I, for one, am looking forward to spotting a cheetah soon in a wildlife reserve in India. If there are any ideas that you would like us to discuss on the show, please do write to us at delhi underscore worklifeindia at bbc.co.uk or tweet using hashtag worklifeindia. We love to hear from you. And for more such interesting conversations, you can also tune in to our podcast. Just search for Worklife India. So till we meet next time, it's Namaste from Devina Gupta.